My focus will be on the importance of the preconception time and very early pregnancy. And I'll explain uh, as I go through my slide set here uh, some of the reasons that I believe that that is so important. The learning objectives will be to try to present some evidence-based recommendations for routine preconception and uh, prenatal care. And uh, I'm going to talk about the maternity care pathway. I was involved in that about five years ago and it actually is downloadable from the Perinatal Services BC website and it has a very good description of pretty well everything I'm going to talk about today and it has a good timing and you'll see some of the slides from it. I'm going to talk about some, pre some antenatal issues and early pregnancy issues. I don't have any investment in prenatal care and this is uh, my son's girlfriend's nephew so I just thought I'd show it. <laughs> So this is the pathway, and the really important thing, it recognizes that pregnancy is a normal physiological process, and interventions uh, should have a very good and important reason to be made. When medicine developed its you know, role in pregnancy care it, in the 50s and 60s, I think it sort of recognized we saved a lot of lives, but we were doing a lot of stuff that was unnecessary. And now we're kind of looking, fortunately, with some evidence based of what are the things that matter. And so I think that we have backed off a little bit and our job is more support than treatment in when it comes to prenatal care. So who provides care for, in, uh, for pregnant women in Canada? Um, well, about 58% interestingly are provided by OBs and 34% by family doctors. In BC we do a better job with that. We do uh, about 50% of um, prenatal care is done by uh, family doctors. When it comes to interpartum care, we actually do a lot better than the rest of Canada where we're prov pro providing about 30% of the interpartum care as opposed to 15% of the rest of Canada. I looked at some of the data that you might have seen from the National uh, Physician Survey in 2012 uh, about medical residents. This is the residents, now this is not what actually happens, but we see that um, it's no surprise that 66% uh, of the medical family practice residents are women, which is higher proportion than other residencies. And uh, when they're asked whether they're going to do maternity care, 44% say that they're probably going to do an, uh, antepartum care, and 27% are interested in, in providing interpartum care. We, in the last month, did a review of all the graduated residents from our program. We are doing well above the national average and from the NIMO. 50% uh, of the graduated residents from our program ha are, do, are the ones who answered the um, survey. 50% are doing maternity care, some aspect of prenatal care, but 33% are providing intercardium care, and that's really, I think, impressive. So why is prenatal care important? It's interesting how things evolved. This was uh, Newsweek from 1999, and they started to realize that that it, it, the things don't just happen after the baby's born, that the um, health begins um, in, the, uh, in the uterus. There's the picture from 1999, and you think how things have changed, what the pictures will show. Um, and there's one from 2010, a um, little bit more provocative, but it says the same thing, how the first nine months. We recognize and we all know that children's environment, whether they're waiting, gaining weight or their exercise patterns, matters for the rest of their life. But what we're recognizing now more than anything is that the interuterine environment help makes a difference too. And in fact, the pre-consisting uh, existence before pregnancy matters. And just as a simple example of that, this graph at the bottom in the right corner talks about the previous, the, the sort of anticipated uh, risk of uh, diabetes in the, in the child. And women who are underweight, have growth-restricted babies, have the same incidence in that fetus developing it when an adult of having diabetes as the women who gain too much weight. So there's a fantastic amount of effect. And so why has that happened? You know, I never heard of this term when I was in medical school, and I'm sure you, there's probably a lot of people here that know a lot more about this, but I've looked at this a lot when I was looking at the reasons when we, I was asked to speak to the um, conference on, mat on maternity care or Women with Babies in Prison, actually, was the name of the conference. And wh why is it important to have mothers with babies? And um, it's got a lot to do with how the genes work and what controls the genes, even after the baby's born. So what is epigenetics? It's about the study of the expression of the gene function. 
The genome is, as you know, the complete DNA, and it carries all the instructions for the proteins that are developed from it. The epigenome, which involves a whole bunch of things that I don't understand, including histones, which kind of package the genetic material to develop proteins, and whether these genes are um, methylated or not, but they mark the genome, and they don't change the order of the sequence, but they change the function. And the interesting things is that this marking of the genes can be passed from generation to generation. So why is it that identical twins, if they're separated at birth, look different in life? It's because that gene um, function is controlled by the environment. And as you know, the neurologic sequence, the neurologic development, there's many, many uh, neurons that are being developed in that first year of life. So, you know, how do you compare this? I like this illustration. You know, you've got a computer. Well, the hardware is the genome, and that you're not going to change. And it's the software that's the epigenome. You know, that's the thing that controls the thing. I went to a meeting, and another person talked about this, as that there's 25,000 genes in your body, right, in, the, in, the, in every uh, uh, cell. And everyone has a dimmer switch. And the epigenome is the dimmer switch. So if we provide appropriate support for babies from the time of conception, those genes will function as they should, and anything, lots of things can interfere it. So epigenetic mechanisms explain my early life experiences, especially in those first few months, can leave chemical marks in the brain, and that influences both physical and mental life. And as I said before, they can be passed to generation to generation. So that's why I think, and I just sort of the biochemistry of why, you know, early and even preconception care is so important. Now here's a question. What's the best thing you could do to ensure and improve maternal child health? Any ideas? We know when we see a woman in that first prenatal visit whether how her pregnancy is going to go, almost always. Pregnancies that are planned, we've got a really good chance of optimizing the care. Pregnancies that are unplanned are often in a situation, especially now what we understand about the epigenetics, is they may turn out not as well as we had hoped or for the family. What's the highest group of uh, unplanned pregnancies? You can guess this. Jeez. Of course. 82% of pregnancies in this age group are unplanned. So already we're looking at you know, pregnancies that might be at risk just because they didn't know and they didn't plan for them. And what's the lowest? Well, of course, the 35 to uh, 39 year olds. What's the highest risk of binge drinking, which, uh, as you know, alcohol affects, is a huge epigenetic effect, right? It's methylate, it methylates the gene and it changes. And that's why alcohol in early pregnancy has such a profound effect depending on the exact moment that it's taken. So what's the highest risk of binge drinking? <laughs> The same as the ones that have the most unplanned pregnancies. So we have, as a responsibility as family doctors, I think, is to try to help and uh, promote uh, adequate contraceptive service. Okay, so let's talk about why um, preconception matters. I talked about the 40% of unplanned pregnancies. Interestingly, unplanned pregnancy, 50% are because of contraceptive failures. So it's not just that women should have adequate contraception, they should have contraception that they understand that works. And it's nice to see that we're kind of moving a little bit more to IUD, IUDs because we know that that has a much higher success rate and um, a useful function for many women. The placenta starts to form at seven days after conception. That is, a week before a woman misses her period. The neural tube closes at 28 days. And so we've got a profound effect for that early time. So I, I talked about the, the um, uh, pathway that is produced by the perinatal services. Uh, this is the pathway, and it has everything you need to know, and I'm not going to um, show you that. I'm going to focus on a couple of issues. First of all, I talked about the benefits of a planned pregnancy and the contraceptive choices. I've already emphasized that. And see, these are some of the next important issues. Folic acid. We know that folic acid is profoundly important in the neural tube function. The average woman who has good, good nutrition, has no particular problems, has no history of uh, neural tube defect in her family, 0.4 is adequate and all prenatal vitamins have that. But if there's a history of, of a neural tube defect, if she has using uh, um, anticonvulsant drugs or anything that puts her at risk, 
we recommend the five milligrams. And it should be done before conception. Vitamin A is important, but one thing that you should remind women is not to take two prenatal vitamins, thinking that two is better than one, because there's some evidence that too much vitamin A isn't good either, so don't take two prenatal vitamins. Vitamin D is the new thing. Everybody is taking vitamin D, I hope, but especially for pregnancy, and we don't know the right amount. There is some evidence that vitamin D will actually help and prevent fetal growth restriction. It will certainly help with enamel uh, preparation in the fetus and uh, prevent heart disease. Um, I think most of us are recommending 1,000 milligrams on top of a regular prenatal vitamin. This is the new one, vitamin C. This just came out, uh, in fact, last month, in May. It's a randomized controlled trial where women were given vitamin C or a placebo, and they found that this is to women who smoked. It's really important. For smoking women, if you give them 500 milligrams of vitamin C during their pregnancy, it, redu it improves the newborn's pulmonary function studies in the first year, and it reduces the wheezing that they present with by 50%, those babies. So it's something to remember in a woman who's smoking. This is probably a nice little intervention we can offer these women. <coughs> and of course, calcium. And uh, certainly, if the woman, uh, we now know that a woman is at risk of pregnancy-induced hypertension or preeclampsia, giving extra calcium in those women actually reduces the risk of future preeclampsia. What about iron? Well, iron's important. The pregnancy need is about 27 milligrams per day, and the North American diet average is about 15, and that's why all prenatal vitamins have some iron. And this is the kind of the, as you all know, depending on the type of iron supplement you use, you have different elemental iron in it. Um, and for most women, the more iron, the more difficult it is to take, right? Uh, there is some, some evidence that the new polysaccharide, the uh, uh, one that was 150 mil, the Ferramax, has uh, uh, more iron and it's a little bit better tolerated, so I mean we haven't had that long enough to really know. What about food safety? I think we all advise women who are pregnant or planning to pregnant to be careful about what they eat and especially to wash their vegetables and wash the fruit before they eat it. Interestingly, you cannot wash uh, alfalfa sprouts or bean sprouts, so it's probably a good thing not to eat when you're pregnant. It's very important that all meats are cooked and the microwave doesn't do it. Raw fish and shellfish should be avoided. And any unpasteurized dairy products, so cheeses that come from Europe that aren't pasteurized should be avoided. Everybody's worried about cats. Well, you know, just wash your hands if you're out in the, in the dirt or wear gloves uh, so you avoid the uh, toxoplasmosis that might be in the, in the, gar in the garden. A lot of um, interest about fish in pregnancy. Uh, fish is actually good because it has omega-3 fatty acids and that's good for the fetal brain. Um, in terms of how much, uh, it's good to have two meals a uh, week with uh, fish if you can and you're pregnant. And the fish that you should have are the ones that have low, um, iron con uh, low uh, sorry, mercury contact. Those on the low in the food chain, if you like, where the, iron, where the um, uh, mercury hasn't been concentrated. So these are the, the fish. And canned light tuna is fine. The white tuna or, or, or albacore tuna is probably should be avoided because it's got a higher um, amount of uh, uh, mercury. And the food that is in the, the ones that are on the top of the food chain, the fish that concentrate the mercury should be avoided. Now, I don't know about you, but a lot of our, fam our patients are taking a lot in herbs and spices and different things that they get from the health food store. And this is actually, I got this from the web, and it, these are all the things they shouldn't take when they're pregnant. So remember that anything women take goes to the baby. And one of the things people don't realize is that we know that topical, we put topical medicines on our skin. It doesn't work on the skin, it works by absorbing into the body. So women who are putting lotions and creams on their skin, they're, they're absorbing that and the fetus is getting a dose of that as much as they are. So I think that any time a woman is putting anything on her body, she should think of the skin absorption as well as what she's taking by mouth. Caffeine, there's always questions about caffeine, and caffeine is fine if you don't exceed a certain amount of limits. And you can see that if you look at the references uh, for Mother Risk, the UK, and NICE, all of them vary amount, amount that they say it's okay. I usually say it's okay to have a couple of cups of coffee a day if you're, if you're pregnant without any risk. And it's interesting that 
a brewed oak or any kind of coffee that most of us have is here, but when you get down to coca, it's not very much caffeine and people don't know that. What about weight? As I mentioned to you before, weight gain in pregnancy is significant, but also weight itself. And we should be calculating the BMI in early, uh, at, this is pre-pregnancy BMI, because that's all these, this data comes out for, okay? So the pre-pregnancy BMI, does it matter? Well, if you're underweight, and that's not that common, but it is a significant problem for the developing fetus because of nutritional challenge of that early pregnancy development. Those women underweight have a risk of preterm birth, the small for gestational age babies, neonatal mortality and morbidity, and adult illness when they're older. So somebody counsel women if they're planning a pregnancy if they're significantly underweight. Obesity. Um, I don't know about you, but I never have any obese patients in my practice. Does anybody? <laughs> so it's becoming more and more a problem, and it is a huge one for the mother herself. Her gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, thromboembolic disease, the fact that the baby doesn't come through the birth canal very well, dystocia, increased cesarean section, increased infection. All of those are, are definitely increased in women who are, have a BMI greater than 35, I mean, sorry, greater than 30, which isn't that heavy, actually. And for the neonatal, these, are, these babies will be bigger. They'll have more risk of abnormalities, which is interesting. Again, because of the epigenetic effect. Blood sugars are, are, are lower sometimes because of the hyperglycemia they get in the pregnancy, and of course, more jaundice. And even modest increase in the maternal BMI will increase perinatal mortality. And this is a study that came out um, in 2014. So we really, it's not just a benign thing, it's an important thing. And why is it? Why does obesity matter? Well, they can have impaired glucose tolerance. But the lipids actually cause an inflammatory condition in the woman. And that affects placental function and platelet aggregation. So there's a physiologic basis for the obesity causing a problem. They have more sleep apnea. And an, one of the hallmarks when women are later in pregnancy that we ask is, how's the baby moving? And that, when they're heavy, they don't, they don't feel as well. Just as an aside, what's the most, the best test of the well-being of the fetus? Movement. Movement. Mother's intuition. I guess Jameis has heard me. The mother's intuition, right? If she thinks the baby's well, it almost always is. And I think when I get to the early pregnancy care, we emphasize that. And that's the, not only for the mother when she's pregnant, but when she's delivered her baby. Mothers know about their babies. And I always say, don't let anybody tell you, if you think there's a problem with your pregnancy or your baby, if you still believe it, keep asking. This is another study just in 2014 showing that a pronounced increased risk of stillbirth with an increased BMI. And the BMI of 30 to 35 is a two, twice, but when you get to be uh, in the 40 to 50 range, your, your uh, perinatal uh, um, mortality is, is dramatically higher. So just to emphasize the point about weight. So what's the next thing that you'll be thinking about? This is, always, this is all before the woman is even pregnant, right? So you talk about genetic history, and of course that's important, and there are some screening uh, things that we would want to do for, for if there's a family history of these, these conditions. Women who have recurrent pregnancy loss, it, depending on their age is when they start investigating. I know you probably have had patients in their 30s who have had two pregnancy losses in a low in a row, excuse me, we might send them for investigation, but usually if greater than three pregnancy losses, there is about a 5% chance that they have themselves a chromosomal abnormality. And it's, um, the paternal uh, rearrangement matters too, of course. It's always a risk. We always ask our women about substance use, of course, that's important because again, affecting the environment for the baby in the early time in pregnancy. And of course, we talk about harm reduction. It's interesting, do you, are you familiar with the term uh, minimal intervention? It's, uh, there's some really good evidence out there that you don't, if somebody comes in with some, we do this in family medicine all the time, right? Somebody comes in with something that, we're, that obviously isn't very healthy for them. If we take five seconds or 10 seconds just to talk about it, it makes a difference. There is evidence that a brief intervention makes a difference and that goes for smoking, from alcohol, for drug use. So, we shouldn't avoid the issue uh, just because we think it's going to take time. 
we all should ask about prescription medicines and it's very important that women know that even Tylenol has evidence that it's not safe particularly in the pregnancy. I mean it's probably the safest one but the wor it's much worse than NSAIDs. We're not talking about aspirin here, baby aspirin. We're talking about things like um, ibuprofen and Aleve that it actually is associated with increased risk of spontaneous abortion and some cardiac defects. So women who are planning pregnancy or early pregnancy advise them to not to take their, the NSAIDs for, for pain. Tobacco, again, this is an opportunity for brief interventions. And alcohol. Alcohol has a profound methylation effect on the, ge the genome of that developing fetus. And that's why we don't know the safe limit uh, of pregnancy uh, for alcohol. So although the, the evidence suggests that occasional drinking in pregnancy, it's hard to show that that has evidence on a population basis of harm. We do recommend that if women know that it's probably best not to drink at all in pregnancy. And that took uh, about a year of national consensus to take that statement because a lot of people, you know, don't want to make women to feel badly if they've had a drink or two, but at the same time to clarify the, the statement. Of course, there's things that there are toxic teratogens that women should avoid. We want to screen for infection. We know that periodontal disease matters. There is some evidence that uh, uh, periodontal, uh, gum disease, dental problems in pregnancy should be dealt with and, and ideally before pregnancy. The STIs um, and of course the torch viruses that can affect all the women that, we, that we're aware of including herpes and syphilis and those other ones. Vaccination. It is an absolute standard of care that any woman planning to be pregnant or pregnant should have the flu vaccination. When we had the, the bad uh, flu um, epidemic, was it two years ago when we had H1N1? The people that were on the ventilators in the ICU in Alberta and other places were pregnant women. Their immune system's compromised and they're particularly susceptible to influenza respiratory failure. So it's important that women are offered the flu vaccination and all the vaccination, although we acquire some low mercury ones uh, for those pregnant women, but any of that flu vaccination is safe. And the other ones inactivated are probably okay, although most of us tend to avoid unless it's urgent uh, immunizations in pregnancy. So the inactivated ones here are all safe. We, we avoid the live uh, vaccinations, including measles, mumps, rubella, and those ones, and the nasal spray for influenza. But the evidence that it actually causes harm is very little, and it's not a reason for terminating the pregnancy. So we go on, and you know, this is, I'm just taking this from that book that you can download. And it's, we talk about medical conditions. We talk about their past obstetrical history, of course, because that would matter. We talk about uh, their gynecological history, if they're going to have problems getting pregnant, certainly if they've had an ovary removed or some a significant infection, that will make a difference. And we want to talk about any chronic medical condition. If women are planning pregnancy or considering pregnancy, to be as well as possible for the physiologic challenge of pregnancy is important. And then access individual and extra resources that is available in your community. We're seeing a little bit of this too, of course, is that the age of women who are getting pregnant are often older now as a first pregnancy than in the past. And uh, it's a wake-up call, and I, I, I gave this talk to the residents, um, it was the last year or the year before, and when I looked out there, there was, um, most of these young women were in their 30s. <laughs> were you there? I don't know. And I said, you know, you shouldn't be getting pregnant early. And of course, many of them hadn't become pregnant yet. So I felt badly when I was, I was giving this talk. Uh, <laughs> so I, I kind of feel badly when I say it. But it does matter. And, you know, now 20% of births in Canada are over 35 in, in, when they're with their uh, births. And of course, uh, especially in my women over 40. Um, and there is some problem uh, getting pregnant uh, later. And the risk of... Um, um, of over, women over 40 in, in pregnancy, um, they have twice the risk of miscarriage. Um, of course, issues around pul uh, pulmonary embolism, gestational diabetes, uh, small growth of the baby, and uh, increases cesarean section in general. For babies, it affects them too, of course, and they have a higher risk of preterm birth, low birth weight, 
and uh, congenital uh, anomalies, which is interesting. Now, this is a study from the 50s in Hutterite women uh, who had never been exposed to any kind of a, um, a contraceptive. And you show that, that by 40 years old, more than a, about a third of women are infertile. In other words, they can't get pregnant. And that is something that women don't realize when they think, well, we'll just go for IVF. After 37, most places are not considering offering um, egg retrieval and IVF of their own eggs because of the unsuccessful nature of the fertility treatment. So it is important that somewhere in the late 30s a woman should be thinking about um, if she wants to have one of her eggs uh, fertilized. I guess that's not a nice thing to say, but it's the way it is. So this is just reiterates the um, issues around uh, the rate of uh, uh, intrauterine fetal demise. One thing that as family doctors we recognize now, those of us who give, who give care for women who are pregnant, if a woman is in the 40s, the risk of a stillbirth at 39 weeks is the same as a woman who's a young woman um, at 42 weeks. So the guidelines for post-dates pregnancy inductions, some of your patients may, may have this, are different in a woman in the 40s. And most of us bring those women in at around 39 weeks now. So again, there's a whole bunch of women that need additional care. And this goes through it, and I won't go through that, but these are women who have issues around either psychosocial, phys met uh, mental, or uh, physical health. And um, those, uh, these are women who have uh, uh, experienced problems in the previous pregnancy. Um, it's interesting, there's some confusion. What is the definition of a grand multiparous woman? Um, some say they have, they've had six babies, and some say five babies. It doesn't matter. Once you've had five babies, I think you qualify. Okay, so that's, she's not even been pregnant yet, okay? So this is the, the issues, and, and they're similar to the issues that we offer women who are early in pregnancy. So a lot of the things I've already said applies to that first pregnancy visit. So this is really important if you don't do maternity care, but your patient comes to see you. I'm gonna emphasize four very important things. And again, this is the, um, uh, that guideline that you can download. But the important thing is, is that you wanna make sure that they're on folic acid, because after, um, 12 weeks, the neural, you know, the neural tubes close, so it's really important that the folic acid be um, you know, on board at the right dose early, if not before pregnancy. This is the second most important thing, is that you want to nail the due date. And it, it's changed a lot, and I'll show you uh, something. We, we recommend that all women are receive an early pregnancy ultrasound for dating purposes. And the dating ultrasound, as long as it's after seven weeks, is the way we date pregnancies now. Even if they're reliable, regular periods. Because it's now we know that the ultrasound is more accurate than a woman's last menstrual period. And that's a change in the last several, well, last year, actually, from the guideline. Now, in the guideline, it says offer women at 11 to 14 weeks. In, and the reason for that is, is this is a national guideline, and anybody who sees me in the video who's in uh, Ontario, that's what you do, because all women are offered nuchal translucencies as part of the maternal serum screening process. In BC, only if you're only 35 or older, or if you have twins or some other issues, are you offered a nuchal translucency. I'll show you what that is in a minute. Nuchal translucencies are done around this date. But in Nanaimo, because we don't have that for women under 35, or if they are over 35, they have to travel, if you can believe it, to Comox or Victoria to get the nuchal translucency study. We're doing our best to try to convince our radiologists to start doing it. But if they're going to go down to Victoria, you really need to know their dates, right? So in Nanaimo, we actually, um, this is why, I'm sorry, I'm just going back. This is why it was recommended in the post-dates pregnancy um, guideline that they have this ultrasound to uh, decide dates. So I mentioned that 7 to uh, 23 weeks uh, use the alone. That's interesting, isn't it? And I would have thought that they should have said I mean, maybe up to 18 weeks or 16 weeks. But the ultrasound is, is, um, is the way to um, uh, date pregnancies now. And as long as it's over 7 weeks. So in Nanaimo, I think it's a good idea for us uh, to try to get, if you see women, to get an ultrasound somewhere around nine weeks, give or take. Because that's important because it allows them to have adequate prenatal genetic screening knowing the dates, because those dates are so important for all women to be offered prenatal screening. 
So now this is why we need to know the dates, because the dates matter for screening for aneuploidy. Aneuploidy is trisomies, usually 21, but 18 and 13 also. This is a, a standard of care. If women aren't offered this and the baby come, you know, and the woman has never heard about this and she has a baby with Down syndrome, it's absolutely slam dunk malpractice. So if she decides to move ahead with that. Um, so it's really important that all women, this is a risk management issue, are offered maternal with the appropriate information. So this is from the guideline, is that information about prenatal screening for Down syndrome and other neural tube defects should be given to all pregnant women at the first contact because these organization of these dating and these plans need to be done. And this should be at the first trimester prior to 10 weeks gestational age, allowing the appropriate tests to be done. The BC um, guideline is downloadable from the BC uh, Prenatal Genetic Screening Program and it's, it's a nice guideline and, all, and actually the things I have are from that. And this is it. This is again a guideline that you can download and it's useful to have because it has a good flow chart because this is really complicated but it is quite simple too if, at the same time. This is the, the menu, if you like, of the prenatal screening we have, we have to consider for women. For most women, under 35, it's the serum integrated prenatal screening is what they offer, are offered. And this is a test. We now recommend, instead of 11 weeks, we recommend that it starts at 10 weeks. And another one around 16 weeks. All women are offered this at least. And the best time is 10 to 11 weeks for the first test, which is the PAPE, the pregnancy associated plasma protein of pregnancy, PAPE. And, um, and the second test at 16 weeks. If they're over 35, they get the same tests with offered this nucleotranslucency I'll talk about in a minute. If they're beyond the timing here of the first test, 14 weeks, so if they show up in my office, they've never been offered this at 16 weeks, all, all I can offer them is the quad screen. And that's the, the, what used to be, um, these are the four tests that are done as a second test. If they're over 35, or there's a couple of other reasons, they will have an opportunity to have this nuchal translucency. And the nuchal translucency is this translucency behind the neck of the baby that's done on ultrasound. You'd think it would be so easy for them to do, but they've got to have a right uh, uh, cut on them. And they, the um, ultrasound uh, has to be uh, certified to do it. So that, if that's large, it's abnormal. So they want to have a normal nuchal translucency. So what they do with the integrated screen is that you have this test at 10 weeks, you have another blood test that's about 16 weeks, and, so, and, before, and around 12 weeks you have this study done, and all of that information is sent to the provincial program, and then they print out a report for you, and I'll show you that in a minute. The other things that you know, we don't do very often now is uh, CVS and uh, amniocentesis now, yeah, there, there's, and there's something new on that, and I'll just show you in a minute. The last test that I'll talk about briefly is non-invasive uh, prenatal testing, and that is so cool. And that's going to actually change the way we think about prenatal screening in not too uh, distant future. So I'm not going to go through this, but the guideline has this in it. And it's important to know that it depends on the, the situation of the woman, when she presents to you, which tests you can offer her. All of that should be offered to women now, and it does take time. And one thing that I think we have to know is the, I'll show you in a minute about the traditional way of doing obstetrics where you guys, most of it were, maybe were trained where you have a, the first prenatal visit and then you see them again in a month. There's no way. The early pregnancy care takes a lot of time. And I never, I always spend a full half hour with the first visit and I don't even examine them at that time. I just talk about all the things that are so matter and I get them back again. And I use an 0120 for that first visit because there is a billing for the physical for the first. So if MSP is listening, I'm doing it. So anyway, I won't go through this because there's too much to say. And then it goes on to show that there are a few situations where a woman has had a prenatal uh, baby with an affected baby, then they will have uh, more options for screening than the average. If there's a certainly uh, other reasons, twins and, um, and so on. Interesting, some aspects of uh, uh, infertility treatments like uh, intracytoplasmic sperm injection have a higher risk of genetic defect and those women are offered 
um, different testing. So this is all in the guideline. Traditionally, before the maternal shame screening, women wanted to have their babies before 35, right? And, that, and the reason for that was at about one in 200 times there was a genetic defect. And so women, in the, when we had our babies, if you had, a baby over, if you had a baby over 35 years, that you were 35, you were offered an amniocentesis because of this. The problem with amniocentesis, it, depending on where you look, it has about a 1 in 200 to 1 in 500 harm rate of the pregnancy itself. So one of the reasons women were resistant to have this genetic screening was because if it was positive or if it was suggestive, let's say they did all those tests and it came back, they had a chance of a Down syndrome of 1 in 150, it's still pretty unlikely but they're going to worry about it and now they have to make a choice to have a, a test that has a 1 in 200 chance of harming the pregnancy to know or not. And that was a, a lot of women declined screening for that reason. But now we have a test that actually is, it's so cool. It, by 10 weeks, there is cell-free fetal DNA in the maternal circulation. It's about a tenth of the cell-free DNA of the mother, but it can be identified in the mother's blood test by 10 weeks. Right now, at 10 weeks of pregnancy, if you wanted, you could get a full genome analysis of your baby with a blood test in the mother. That isn't done now commonly, but I can, you know, at some stage it's going to be. And this test, you could also tell the, ge uh, the gender of the baby and a few other things, all these things. But what we're going to use in Canada right now is how to integrate this test into the existing prenatal screening program. And um, I'm actually the family practice representative on a study, a national study called Pegasus, which is looking at a study looking at uh, NIPT testing and trying to integrate it into the existing perinatal, uh, prenatal screening systems. And it's probable that it's going to be used as a second-tier test. So for women who screen positive with the blood tests, will be offered, free of charge, hopefully, this test rather than amniocentesis. This is really uh, the new stuff that, that you really need to do, to know. So for aneuploidy, it's not 100% but it's very good at saying it, there isn't a problem. So if you have a negative NIPT test for trisomy 21 or 18 or 13, it's almost certain that that baby doesn't have it. If you have, and I'll show you an example of the report here. So I'll, I'll show you that in a minute because it's kind of, I'm going to show you how it can be integrated into the existing system. Does everyone, has everyone seen these reports? Um, when a woman has the standard prenatal screening, the 11-week the and the 16-week or the 10-week and 16-week study, when you get back, or if, it, if she's had a, a nuchal translucency as part of it, you get this report back. And I, it's not a very good picture. I'm not sure why it's, it's so clear. But these are the five analytes they tested, whether they're means or the multiple. And then in this woman, it says a screen positive. And I'm sorry you can't read it because my, I don't know why it's so blurry. But this said it was uh, one in 210 chance of having a Down syndrome, yet it was screen positive. So that's still pretty unlikely. The other thing that they look at now when you do these studies is how, what is the mean of the multiple of these five analytes that are tested, both the PAP-A, which is the most important one for placental development, and these four other elements. And then if they're abnormal in terms of the means of the multiple, that puts that pregnancy at risk. So what we're in fact doing here is not only having a blood test to see if the baby's at risk of a genetic defect, we're getting a blood test that tells us the well-being of the placenta and potentially risks to the baby. So this, when you offer maternal serum screening to women, you should be asked, um, advising about this. So this is the, we said, so the analytes, the first trimester analyte, the second trimester analytes. This is for aneuploidy, which is a screen positive. And this, at pregnancies at risk, and, and in this case, you can't read it, but they've recently changed this. This used to be 0.4 mean of the multiple. Now they've dropped it to 0.15 mean of the multiple to be abnormal. I can't really read this, but she was positive at that time. And so um, the things, if these tests are abnormal, those are the kind of things that you can see in the baby. 
So we've changed the means of the multiple and, and those are come out now. That we mentioned the PAPE, of the pregnancy PAPE. The likelihood of a uh, preeclampsia in that woman, if your PAPE is very low, is significantly elevated if you have a low PAPE in pregnancy. And that's why they've gone now to about a 0.15 mean of the multiple. So what happens if you've got an abnormal screen? 16 weeks, now you get the report back at 17 weeks. What do you do? In this test, where they had a, a potential abnormality in the developing pregnancy, well, what we know now is that the, the blood supply to the placenta tells us the well-being of the placenta. And if you can assess the blood supply to the uterus, which is mainly going to the placenta, you can tell how well that placenta has developed. And so by doing a uterine artery Doppler and seeing whether there's good supply in the diastole, in the maternal diastole, meaning flow always through the flow, you can tell that the placenta is probably okay. And here's an example of a normal uterine artery Doppler, good flow in the diastole, systole. And here's an example where there's a problem or potential problem where you've got the goods flow in the diastole, what's called an early diastolic notch, meaning that there's problems in the flow. And so that pregnancy might be at risk. So this is the second tier test for someone who's had an abnormal maternal serum screening of the placenta. So here's a patient. Uh, it's a patient of mine, actually. She's 32. She had that test, which was screen positive. This is before NIPT. So she went to have an amniocentesis, and fortunately, everything was well. However, because her PAPE was low, we sent her over to the clinic in Vancouver called the Emma Clinic. Uh, this is a high-risk, uh, great little clinic that actually, you see a periodontologist, they do the uterine artery Doppler, they actually have a genetic person that sees them, and they're available for these women if, if you have this. Anyway, so we identified this, and I referred her to the Emma Clinic, and she had a uterine artery Doppler. And this isn't actually hers, but this is the one that was just like she had, where she had that uterine artery uh, um, notching, I mean, uh, di diastolic notching. So this is the report I got back. It showed she had a bilateral notch. I'm sorry you can't read it. The risk of preeclampsia in her, they estimated to be 60%. Remember, she's only 18 weeks pregnant. 20, well, she's about 20 weeks pregnant now. So what they recommended is that I be follow her very carefully and do these some ultrasounds and watch this woman for growth restriction and preeclampsia. So the whole pattern of way we follow women now will change depending if they have these tests. As it turned out, she was one of the 40% who did fine. Just as a personal story, I had a patient who saw me <coughs> order this test and her PAP A was 0.14 mean of the multiple. And she stopped seeing me, she went to see another caregiver um, and they I don't know if the caregiver ever knew about this, this or whatever, she declined a further investigation and that baby went on to um, a, a crash section at 32 weeks and it was grossly restricted. The baby could have died. So I think we have to, can't ignore this. We have to act on these abnormalities. So this is a woman, another patient of mine. She's um, 31 and uh, she had a screen positive, this time a 1 in 50 of Down syndrome. So normally we, she would have gone for her amniocentesis to rule that out. Instead, she went to NIPT and this is her report. And this is what you get back. And what it showed is this. Her chances of having Down syndrome was one in 10,000. And all it took was a blood test. Now she had to pay $790 for it because that's what it costs right now. We're hoping it starts to be covered. What about prevention? So you have a woman who comes in who's had previous pregnancy-induced hypertension, or what we used to call, now we call it uh, preeclampsia. Is there anything that you can do to reduce her risks of having that? And that's important because you may see these women who have had that history and are coming back early in their pregnancy. It is important to know that low-dose aspirin helps, but introduce it after 12 weeks. So 12 week you know, introduction of uh, aspirin does reduce the risk of preeclampsia and growth restriction in this babies. If it's after 16 weeks, it doesn't seem to make any difference. So it's important as the placenta is sort of developing early on. That was a study in 2010. This was actually in April 2014, just this year. And it is reiterated, this is a much larger study. And so the numbers aren't quite as impressive, but it's still something that they should be offered. So a woman has uh, hypertension, pre-existing 
uh, is, has marked obesity, has other risk factors for preeclampsia, it's not a bad idea to suggest the low-dose aspirin at, at 12 weeks. Okay, so uh, routine pregnancy uh, schedule. What are the next things you want to do? You want to start talking about making sure that they're not taking things that they, you don't know about or they don't know about is not necessarily good. You've talked about the alcohol. These are things that I mentioned in the preconception part of my talk. And um, screen for substance use. This is interesting. This is the model of care that I was trained in, that you probably were trained in, is that you saw them once early in pregnancy and then you saw them every month and then when they got closer every two weeks and then weekly in the last month of their pregnancy. You know where that came from? Ministry of Health in the UK, 1929. <laughs> okay? So with all of these tests, NIPT, the serum analytes, all these things that we can do now, the whole approach to care is being turned upside down where women need to be assessed early and offered these assessment parameters, doing their history, doing their evaluation. And this is a guy named Nicolaitis who's like, he's written a whole bunch of articles on this stuff in the UK. Um, and what he, this article says is that with appropriate uh, blood testing and ultrasound and history, that they basically by 13 weeks should be able to know whether a woman's going to have any problem in her pregnancy. So what we should be doing is we should be seeing these women intensively early in pregnancy and then stratifying them. The ones that have risk factors continue intensively assessing and the other ones maybe not seeing them as often. But we all know that as a pregnancy goes along there's a lot of things not only about the baby, you want to talk about the woman and the, the issues around support in labor and you know the inconveniences and discomforts of pregnancy that we all talk about. So I don't think that's quite right and I think a model more like this is probably the best where we do see them more frequently at the beginning. In the middle of the pregnancy, it's usually a coasting time if they're well, and then towards end, that it's a little bit more frequently. So what do you do for screening tests? What are the tests you order if you're going to start the pregnancy? These are the tests that are recommended. Certainly, every woman should have the antibody test, the blood group, the hemoglobin and the, and the MCV, uh, HIV, rubella teeter, the standard test for syphilis and, and hepatitis. The new uh, guideline is, is that all women who are pregnant should be offered a TSH. Why? Because the fetus is really sensitive to hypothyroidism. And the numbers, the normal numbers, is really important to know, is that because of the protein changes in pregnancy, the normal TSH in women in the first trimester is no more than 2.5. So if a woman comes in as a TSH of 3 or 4, that woman needs to be assessed, repeat it, order the antithyroid antibodies, and consider starting her on thyroid hormone. In the second trimester, it's a little higher, and some people accept up to 3.5 in the third trimester in terms of the normal TSH, but it is not 4 or 5. Interestingly, if you have a really suppressed TSH, 0 0.08, that's probably fine because of the issues around early pregnancy. So hyperthyroidism should be not considered as much as we do in the normal population. So that's really important. We offer screening, of course, to all women, and now we can do that with a cervical swab when you do the pap smear, or even a urine test is, is acceptable. All women should have an early pregnancy midstream urine for, to diagnose asymptomatic back, significant bacteriuria. If they've had a history of urinary tract infection, they should be screened every trimester and, and treated appropriately because that puts them at risk of preterm birth. Another thing that we recommend now is that although the guideline recommended that a hep C testing be done only with risk factors, I don't know about you, in my practice, the people with hepatitis C have, sometimes have never had any risk factors. So I think most of us are now offering hepatitis C testing to all pregnant women. If a woman is at risk of diabetes, you know, the, the woman that's, that comes in and she's got a BMI of 43, or has had a history of dia uh, diabetes in pregnancy, they do actually suggest that you might do some kind of testing for diabetes in the first pregnancy visit to know what the glucose status is rather than waiting for 28 weeks. Obviously, pap test if it's indicated. There's nothing about pregnancy that makes that unique. And these other testing for mumps, toxo, and so on, is not, there's no routine testing, but it would be depending on the presentation. There are some women who are teachers who come in and they're very stressed about possibly getting, you know, B19, which is slap cheek, because they look after kids. And so some women know those I will offer a screen to see if they're immune or not. And so if there's an outbreak in their classroom and they're not immune, then they can be excused.
The screening for alcohol use, this is available on our prenatal record. It's the tweak tool as opposed to some others, and um, it is a useful screen uh, if you have some suspicion. So what else do you do? Well, you discuss options for maternity care, and I guess that's, uh, um, we try to. Uh, and I think for you, if, if you're not doing maternity care, and you have to decide, number one, how long you're going to look after the women in their early pregnancy, or you're going to send them to somebody uh, who looks after pregnancy. Our group of family practice maternity caregivers in Nanaimo, none of us have ever turned away a patient who's referred to us. And all of us would, would be delighted to see them as early as possible. Now, I guess sometimes if we're away on holiday, there may be other issues that some of us may not be able to, but I think all of us, because of what I've showed you, how things have changed so much, it is very helpful to be comfortable with all this stuff you know, in early pregnancy. Uh, you want to do their BMI for the reasons I talked about, and you're going to go through many of these issues that um, are important. And of course, you, you're going to do a physical and um, uh, seasonal flu, I've mentioned that. So of course, you're going to calculate the BMI. And when a woman comes in with her BMI, this chart is available, uh, Health Canada Gestational Weight Guidelines. It's actually in your book if you want to take it. This is very helpful because if a woman comes in and she's underweight, a good rule of thumb, 15 kilos through the pregnancy. And if you say that right away, then they know that you're going to be letting them know what their weight is, but you're not going to nag because no woman wants to hear, hear about how much weight she's gaining in pregnancy most times. If they're uh, normal weight, about 12 and a half kilos, about 10 if they're overweight, and if they have a BMI greater than 7.5. If they're over 35 or 40, they don't need to gain any weight in pregnancy. I've got a patient now who fit that criteria and she hasn't gained any weight in pregnancy. And her blood, she's got diabetes and, and she's not gained any weight and, and the baby is, is doing really well. One thing that we always tell women too is about pregnancy, about when they eat, is that they're eating twice as well, not twice as much. <laughs> and even at the most uh, vigorous time in pregnancy when the baby's growing, the total extra calories they need amounts to an extra slice of toast and an extra glass of milk. That's all. And it's hard because women, you know that the normal blood sugar in pregnancy is lower than normal. The average blood sugar in pregnancy, fasting, is about 3.3 .3 to 4.4. And that is less than the average not pregnant. And I think that's probably evolutionarily important so women gain weight when, they, you know, uh, when there's not a lot of food around. But when there is, then you can't trust your appetite. So it's a good idea to give this information early on so, um, and some resources. There's a whole bunch of things here I'm not going to go through. These are the things in the, in the guide that you can discuss with women if you're not familiar with it. Uh, some of the things I've already, in fact, most of the things I've talked about. What about work? I think it's important that we should be emphasizing that pregnancy is a healthy time, but of course there are some jobs that put women at risk. And there is some evidence that maybe 10 hours a day may not be a very good thing if you're standing that time. And, uh, you know, mental stress and noise. So I think that if a woman has a, um, a job where she needs to stand for more than three to six hours, then I think that we have to support them and maybe s allow them to see if they can s uh, find an alternate uh, a work in, the, in, their, in their job place. Hot tubs are fine as long as the temperature is not more than 39 re degrees. This is something we often get asked. I like this one, stretch marks. Nothing makes a difference. And it's really important that they don't put stuff on their skin because that is absorbed, as I mentioned, goes to the baby. And there is, there's somebody did a study, they, uh, they used, a, I think it was um, oh, coconut oil or coca, coca oil, which isn't coconut, and they actually saw some fetal arrhythmia because of the absorption of the cocoa, which is a cardiac irritant. So I think it's important to know that, um, you know, maybe if they want to put Vaseline on it. I mentioned the importance of dental hygiene. And that is really important, and it may reduce preterm birth, although the, the literature is inconclusive about that. Certainly it doesn't hurt. Exercise. Everyone should exercise in pregnancy. And the old thing about the talk test, as long as you have, have, can speak while you're exercising, it's fine. There's very little sports or, that women can't do in pregnancy. They shouldn't be jumping out of airplanes, I suspect, or scuba diving, but everything else is probably okay. The ideal is 30 minutes most days. Uh, and that's really important, is that we really have to emphasize that because there's really good evidence that exercise reduces the risk of cesarean section. So weight gain and exercise. 
And you know, there are some absolute contraindications. I put this in your book, and I just showed that it's there, relative and absolute uh, contraindications. There's not many of them, but obviously, I've got a patient right now who's got a placenta previa. And she's 33 weeks, so I've advised her, or 34 weeks, I advise her not to do much exercise. <laughs> So uh, there, are, there are cases where, where you want to reduce activity. I'm probably going to get close to being finished here, uh, but I want to just, uh, what we do at each preg pregnancy visit, what it matters, we do the blood pressure. Fetal movement. Fetal movement is actually a very reliable, a very good thing to talk to women about. Once they're 26 to 32 weeks, is that they should be aware of their fetal movement, and if they have concerns about the movement, to lie on their side, and count, and they should feel six movements, and I always go like this, I'd say six movements in two hours, six movements in two hours, and they kind of visually remember that, and if they feel six movements two hours, it's almost always okay, but then at the same time I say trust your intuition, and if you still are worried, come in. The studies that didn't show benefit for fetal movement counting, which and you'll, if you look at the uh, Cochrane, they'll say it doesn't make a difference, they include studies where women were not told to come right in for care. Some of those studies, women ate it up to two days before they sought any care. And remember, the reason fetal movement matters is that when a baby is hypoxic or acidotic, it centralizes its blood flow. It goes to its brain, heart, and adrenals and comes away from the muscles. The baby isn't moving because it's hypoxic. And if a hypoxic baby is not in labor, that means you're at a risk of losing that baby. So trust fetal movement as an important sign. We measure the fetal heart rate, of course, and uh, plot growth. That is useful um, because it does give you the idea if there's a growth restriction. So we do a genetic screening, as we talked about, in 16 weeks, and then we offered a detailed ultrasound. That is really important. Again, uh, that is a fundamental component of care for the placental location and fetal detail. This is when you start talking about VBAC. We encourage all women to consider a, a vaginal birth after cesarean section now. If they're RH negative, they need to have repeat blood testing at 26 weeks to 28 weeks, and they need RH immune globulin, all women who are RH negative. If they have bleeding at any time in their pregnancy, that's important. So if a woman comes in, she's RH negative, and she spots at 10 weeks, she needs RH globulin. Because until we do NIPT and know the baby's blood type, <laughs> you have to assume the baby's positive. So all women bleeding, negative, pregnant, negative uh, uh, blood type, all need blood. I mean, uh, RH mean globulin. Screening for diabetes, I think all of us recommend uh, uh, one of the two elements, which is either a, a proper 2-hour GTT or else 50-gram screen, depending on risk. Remember that perinatal depression is really important. Not only during the pregnancy, but after. I mean, in terms of um, the numbers, I mean, you know, 12% of women will have some depression. And I think most of us remind women that that is important and to seek care if that happens. And there's no preventative strategies. So we have to provide women with support when that happens. So I'm not going to go through the rest of this because this is uh, pretty well the end. I just wanted to bring this up because it is in that guideline that you can access online. And, uh, Membrane sweeping is interesting. It can reduce the number of women to go post dates, but you have to do it twice a week after 38 weeks. I, I, uh, I always tell women it's, it's a quite uncomfortable, although I've never personally had it. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, stop here because I think we know. Um, I wanted to show you, this is an interesting thing that's also available from the, the Perinatal Services BC. It's a pregnancy passport and in it, it explains to the women why they're having things, what they're having throughout their pregnancy, and an opportunity to document their weights. And, and I find that women who do this actually find that, that they do find that they, it helps them in terms of, and then there's a whole bunch of ref, uh, resources that is available. So that's my talk, and I thank uh, you for videotaping.